Acts chapter 4. In just a moment we will be reading from that passage of Scripture. Once again, we'd like to welcome everyone, especially those that might be visiting this morning. Glad you're here. It's good to be here with you this morning, worshiping and serving God. We have some that are passing through town, perhaps some that might even be of the community. Whatever the case, if you have any need whatsoever, we would like to help you if we can. Otherwise, we bid you Godspeed and hope you'll come back to be with us if opportunity does present itself in the future. If you're in Acts chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Oh, this was a glorious time in the infancy of the church. The Messiah had come, the apostles had seen him, had heard him, and they were sharing all that they knew about him and the gospel, and men and women were coming to the Lord in droves. Brethren were seen here selling off their possessions so that any that might have need would be provided for. There's one man in particular that we will see named here. He's called out specifically. His name is Joseph, or Joseph. He's from the island country of Cyprus. Pick up the reading again there in verse 36. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. At such an early time in the development of the church, here is a man who has developed somewhat of a reputation that stands out. This man's name, Joseph, changed. The apostles renamed him, called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Obviously, named so because of his reputation. You know, reputations are a funny thing. Sometimes they can be misplaced. One can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the resulting circumstances could tarnish your reputa reputation, perhaps even for the rest of your life. And that's unfortunate. Yet, unfortunate as it may be, it happens. I can think of one particular example. Have you ever heard of anyone by the name of Typhoid Mary? Typhoid Mary. Mary lived during a period of time when diseases were fairly common. She didn't actually contract the disease, typhoid fever. She was a cook and was found to be a carrier of the disease. And because of her occupation, subsequently she infected dozens of people. As a result of that, she was confined to her home for basically the rest of her life. How unfortunate that was. And she obtained this unfortunate nickname because of circumstances that were essentially out of her control. But sometimes there have been those who are just scoundrels, horrible people. Their reputation is known, and it's for that that they obtain perhaps a nickname or are renamed. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of Chemical Ali? He was Saddam Hussein's defense minister who's credited with killing thousands with chemical weapons. He was captured, convicted of genocide, and in 2010, he was hanged. On the flip side, during that same period of time, do you remember a man by the name of Stormin Norman Schwarzkopf? He was an American military general who was decorated for his fierce service to our country. That was a positive nickname. Stormin Norman, everybody called him. Back to Barnabas. In his case, he was obviously well-known. Even at this early time in the development of the church, we first learn of this man in this passage as being one of great generosity. He sold his land and brought the proceeds to the apostles' feet so that they could be distributed to others in the brotherhood who might have need. And his reputation didn't just produce the nickname Son of Encouragement. Uh, this rather obscure Bible character was so encouraging that the apostles changed his name to Barnabas. What a legacy to leave. What an example to follow for us. 
So what would your nickname be? What is your defining characteristic? I'd like for us to examine, as you're thinking about that, for a few minutes, this man Barnabas, and find out what we can know about him and perhaps understand why he is such a man of encouragement. Perhaps even we might leave here wanting to imitate this man Barnabas. Let's begin. If we can get things going there. Let's begin, if you would please, considering what we already have known about his giving. But I would like to suggest to you that Barnab Barnabas was an encourager not just as it relates to giving, but giving and receiving. We've already learned about his generosity. If you would please turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Can you see that at all? I hope so. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 4. Indeed, he was known for his giving and his generosity, but here's another little twist on that that I'd like for us to consider. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 4. This is at a time when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are having to deal with the Corinthian church and the way that they are handling their own wealth. They were indeed a wealthy church as we understand it. And the apostle is having to defend himself and Barnabas because they are having to work while they are working for the Lord and in no way are charged against the, the Corinthian church. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? We learn another attribute about Barnabas here. It seems, obviously, from what we've read in Acts, it seems to me anyway, that this was a man of some financial wealth. But what we saw in Acts is that he sold a lot of what he had so that others who were in need would be seen to. But furthermore, when we see him here in his missionary work with the Apostle Paul, he's acknowledged here by Paul as having to support himself financially instead of depending on the Corinthians. Now, I'd like to ask this question at this time. Would it have been wrong for the Apostle Paul and Barnabas to have accepted support from the Corinthians for their work? Of course not. The Apostle Paul acknowledges that when he addresses the Philippian church in Philippians 4 and verse 18. And, and, and in fact, not only acknowledges their help, he praises them for it. So there's certainly scriptural ev evidence for that. But both he and Barnabas refrained from placing a burden upon the brethren at Corinth. While preaching and teaching the gospel, they worked. What an encouragement. He was a generous giver, but he was also humble in receiving as well. Could that be an attribute of us? I'd like to ask another question. This is a question that has been posed to me recently. Is it wrong to be a Christian and have significant wealth. Now, I would like to suggest that if you're in the hearing of my voice, you are of significant wealth relative to the rest of the world. Is it wrong for us to live this way? Well, my immediate answer would be, not if we're sons and daughters of encouragement, as Barnabas was. What do we do with that wealth? What did Barnabas do with it? What do we do with what God has blessed us with? Barnabas saw that no one had need. Let me ask you this. What did Joseph of Arimathea do with his wealth? Well, he was a tremendous blessing that lived at the right place in the right time where he could use his wealth to see to it that Jesus was buried after he was crucified on the cross. What did King David do with his wealth? Well, at the end of his life, he took a significant portion of his wealth and dedicated it to the building of the temple. Turn over with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. What did David's son Solomon do with his wealth, and where did he get it? 
Where did Solomon get all the, the wealth that he had? We'll pick up the reading in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in this place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? Then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. Now we know that down the road, eventually Solomon would stumble through portions of his life, and perhaps partly because of the weight of the wealth that he had. But did God give that wealth to him because he wanted him to sin? Well, of course not. It was a blessing to him. It was considered a blessing to him. He gave it to him because he wanted him to use it, along with his wisdom, to properly care for his children. The same is true for us. As I have said, we are blessed in this country financially, perhaps like no other. And it's not sinful. God will judge us not on what we have, but on what we do. With what we have. The Apostle Paul addressed the Corinthians again with this in his second letter. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he spoke to them and wrote to them about the brethren in Macedonia that gave, gave out of their deep poverty. And from this important example, he's hoping to encourage them and spur the Corinthians on to be just that generous, but out of their wealth. And that's how I think we need to look at our prosperity today. We are indeed wealthy. Are we generous? Are we an encourager in that way, the way Barnabas was? There's a responsibility here that we're talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, I think that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is addressing. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. You know what that means? God's able to give us a lot. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, in other words, that us, because God has given us so much, may have an abundance to hoard it and hide it and save it away? To make absolutely sure that we have a great inheritance for our children? No, he says for an abundance for every good work. There's a responsibility for us if we have great wealth. We need to have a heart like Barnabas and be a great encourager to others in this way. Barnabas was a great encouragement when he stood up for someone's reputation. You ever had to do that? You ever had to take the steps to stand up for someone who has been wrongfully accused or perhaps developed a bad reputation that they can't shake? Go back to Acts chapter 9 if you would please. It's about this time that Paul has been converted. And as we will come... To read later in the book of Acts, he will be a warrior for the gospel, a preacher and teacher that will travel the world trying to convince people to become Christians. But it didn't start out that way. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, he did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. 
And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to, Tr to Tarsus. Then the, the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. Well, after Paul's dramatic conversion that we read about just prior to this, Barnabas, with great courage, vouches for him. When the Jerusalem church was suspicious of this former persecutor of Christians who had told them that he wanted to join their ranks, what might have happened to Paul? You ever wonder about that? If Barnabas had not stood up for him. Wonder what might have happened to Barnabas's reputation for standing up for him. You think he worried about that? I don't think he worried about that at all. Are we known for that? Willing to stand up for someone, even though they may have done something in the past that's not right, but we know who they truly are, and we're willing to stand up and say, hold on just a minute, let me tell you what I know about this person. Even though we might face our own suspicions for following along with someone like that. That's what sons and daughters of encouragement do. Stand up for what is right when they know someone is being wronged. There are a lot of negative people in this world. There are people that are terrible that we have to deal with every single day. But brethren, I want you to listen carefully to me. I have to tell you from my experience, and not just as an elder, but as a member of the Lord's body, not just here, but other places, that oftentimes our harshest critics come from those of our own brethren. Now, I realize there are times when that must be, and we're going to get to Galatians chapter 2 and a little bit later on in the lesson. But this cannot be the prevailing attitude that we have toward one another. My exhortation to you today, among others, is to promote this wonderful, encouraging attribute of Barnabas. He stood up and defended the good that is found in his brethren, in this particular case, the Apostle Paul. You know, Jesus was that way. Just consider his hand-selected apostles. These were not of the religious uh, elite. There was a tax collector, there was a zealot, a handful of fishermen, and others we don't know what their occupation was, but they had a lot of flaws. And with the exception of one of them, they were known for this one thing. They were loyal to Christ. They had their struggles. Some would even later on argue <laughs> over who was the best. One would even deny knowing Jesus when Jesus was at his darkest hour. But Jesus loved them. He told God that he loved them. Sometimes our love must overlook the past of those who need us the most. Barnabas understood this. May we be like Barnabas in this way. Amen. Holy Spirit knew who Barnabas was and he knew what Barnabas was about. You might recall as they launch out into their journey in Acts chapter 13, this was a difficult time. Go back to chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. <coughs> Paul and Barnabas are about to embark on this daunting journey where they would be preaching and teaching the gospel where it had never been heard. And it was a scary time, as we just have read. So often we think about Paul in the missionary journeys forgetting that Barnabas was with him as well. Why do you think the Holy Spirit joined Barnabas to Paul during this very important time in the church and a very difficult time? Would one of great encouragement be valuable to Paul during this difficult time? Absolutely. 
We're gonna, we would read later in Paul's epistles of some of the things they faced. They were nearly put to death on several occasions. The son of encouragement would be a tremendous asset. Are we known for that? Do we have that attribute that when times get really tough, we're there to be an encourager? Barnabas was. Speaking again to what we mentioned before, I'm not here to indict Christians that live in this time period in this country for what we have because we do have it so good. But the fact is, and I think we would all admit to this, we have it easy in our walk with the Lord. Persecution relative to what Peter, James, and John, and Barnabas, and others faced, James, is virtually non-existent. We face other problems in maintaining our walk with the Lord, but that's another lesson, perhaps series of lessons, that we'll talk about in another stand. But I want us to understand this one thing. We don't have to be scourged, beaten, or stoned to be fiercely loyal to the cause of Christ. Brethren, do we stand up for our Lord in the face of anything? What deters us? What do we allow to keep us from worshiping the Lord even as we're doing just now? What deters us from sharing the gospel? What are we afraid of? What deters us from attending a gospel meeting where it's an opportunity for us to study and learn and grow and encourage one another? You know, we're using the word encouragement throughout this lesson. I would like to use the flip side of that for just a moment. The word now is discouragement. We had 280 here a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning. We probably have about 250 or so now. Is that about right? But if recent history bears out in the gospel meeting that will begin exactly two weeks from today, on any given night, we might have about 200. And 50 or 60 of that probably will be visitors. Is it just me? Do you understand what a discouragement it is when we look around on such a, an occasion and see so many empty Do you understand how encouraging it is when this building is packed out to hear the gospel preached, to sing praises together, to pray together? What an encouragement that is. Brethren, I ask again, what deters us? What draws us away? What a great source of encouragement we can be when we're willing to stand up at any occasion and are excited about hearing and spreading the gospel of Jesus. Barnabas was a man of great integrity that could be counted on to preach and teach even the most difficult subjects. Turn back over to Acts chapter 15. You may recall that this was the occasion when there was a major conflict that was taking place between Jewish Christians and Paul and Barnabas, wherein some were making circumcision a requirement for Christianity. Chapter 15 and verse 2 of Acts, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. In addition to the apostle Paul and others, I would point out, that Barnabas was of such a reputation, a Christian leader, a preacher that was sent to Jerusalem as well to discuss and make the final determination on this matter. This was an important moment. This was a critical moment in the history of the church. Indecisiveness on this occasion could have been disastrous. But the decision and the distribution of the letter that detailed that decision was placed in large part in the hands of Paul and Barnabas. Look over at, chap at verse 22 of Acts chapter 15. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas and Silas, leading men 
among the brethren. It would take men of integrity and an ability to preach and teach in a most encouraging way to pull this off. Yes, decisiveness was needed, but encouragement was needed as well. This couldn't have just been handed over in any old way. Men with a reputation and an ability to talk about this hard subject was needed and present this letter. Are we known for that? Do we have such a reputation that when difficulty comes even among our own brethren, that we are sought for help? Do we truly dedicate significant time to studying the Word of God so that we'll be prepared to discuss even the most difficult Bible subjects? It's never too late in our lives to resolve to be this person, to be the encouragement that we can be in this area. I decided a few years ago that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to reading through the Bible every year, and I have thoroughly enjoyed doing that. But I will tell you, I am a terrible memorizer. I have a terrible memory. Anybody that knows me knows that about me. I, my memory's just never been very good. I have to write everything down. You should see my day timer. I actually have entries in my day timer telling me to write things in my day timer. <laughs> my brother-in-law, Tino, is the other side of that. He has an unbelievable memory. He'll come to me in recent days and say, you remember back in 1983? For when we went to Blue Springs, Missouri to that gospel meeting and we heard so-and-so preach on so-and-so. You remember that point that he made? I'm looking at him, are you, are you crazy? I, I don't, he remembers things, I don't. So what I'm trying to do this year, and, and please hold me accountable to this, I'm trying to do my all the way through the Bible reading and be done by June 30th. So I'm doubling up. I want to spend the second half of the year memorizing important passages. And I hope to be able to pull that off. It's never too late to be of such encouragement because of our Bible knowledge. Make a, a, a resolution to be that person. There was another occasion where Barnabas was sent by Jerusalem, in this case, to Antioch. After the execution of Stephen, persecution for Christians grew. And the result was a scattering of God's people. This was another critical time in the history of the church. Uh, but even so, with all this persecution, the church grew, and many were converted, including the area of Antioch. And in the midst of these en encouraging events that were uh, uh, taking place, guess who was there? Flip over to Acts chapter 11. We'll begin reading in verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. What a character to have. What a characteristic to have. Such an encourager. There's always going to be negative things, brethren. There's going to be things that go on the, in the brotherhood and in our work and worship for the Lord that can be at times discouraging. But let us be known as Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, encouraging one another along the way. You knew this was coming. Go ahead and be turning to Galatians chapter 2. We have to look at the reverse of all of this. We're talking about encouragement. What happens when we are a source of dis 
encouragement. When we fail in the area of standing up for truth, when we fail to stand up for what we know is right, we fall to peer pressure and ignore all that we've learned and know that is truth and righteousness. We can be a source of tremendous discouragement. We've already looked at tensions between Jewish and Gentile Christians existed early on and as we have seen and throughout the Gospels and throughout the Epistles, they would continue for many years and they would grow and develop as the church grew and developed. And these tensions caused some of the most faithful brethren and even apostles to stumble. As we saw in Acts chapter 15, Gentile Christians could fellowship Jewish Christians. But this was a challenge for many. You in, in Galatians chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. That's how it's described by Paul. Peter and Barnabas were being called out here because they were being led astray by this Jewish circumcision party. It was, in fact, hypocrisy. I think we can learn a valuable lesson here. <coughs> The son of encouragement fell to peer pressure. His incredible reputation did not prevent him from making a wrong decision. I think we can learn from that. Standing for what is right may cause us to be looked down upon and perhaps even persecuted. Some might try to soil our reputation for standing up for what is right. Does that change anything? It shouldn't. We can learn from this example that it sure shouldn't. Do we waver from the truth when it will make us unpopular? May that never be. One final attribute of Barnabas. Let's kind of try to end on a good note after the Galatians 2 incident. Go back to Acts chapter 15. It's around this time after uh, some of the travels have occurred with Paul and Barnabas that a sharp contention developed between the two, a, a, a contentious disagreement uh, between Paul and Barnabas that would in fact end their ministry together. You in Acts chapter 15, let's begin reading in verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are, are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren but, uh, to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Barnabas wanted to take Mark along another missionary journey with he and Paul. But Paul did not because Mark had abandoned them on a previous trip. And the obvious question that we have to ask, particularly in view of what we already know about Barnabas, is why do you think Barnabas was so intent on working with, Par with Mark, even with Paul being so against it? I would suggest to you that this is this encouraging nature of Barnabas coming out. Had Mark, John Mark, made a mistake, perhaps, Barnabas knew about it. Is that what he fixated on? No, he focused upon the positive of Mark. Paul would eventually describe Mark as useful to me in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. 
But in Mark, Barnabas was able to overlook this previous shortcoming and encourage him on to further great work in the kingdom. Same question, brethren. Are we of such a nature? We have a hard time forgetting the wrong that our brethren do. Are we able to overlook the past faults of our brethren and focus upon the positive and the good? I know if I were to stop right now and just give you the opportunity to think of that one person in your life that has been of the greatest encouragement to you along your walk, that you could think of someone. I'm thinking of someone right now. And it wasn't exactly during a time of my life that I would consider myself to be the stellar Christian. <laughs> but they were of great encouragement to me, even with all of the faults that I might have had. That was Barnabas' nature. Is it ours? There are going to be plenty of opportunities for us to see the negative in one another. But are we as Barnabas able to forgive, to move past, and spur on one another to further great kingdom work? Barnabas could. Barnabas left us a tremendous legacy. He was a strong man of faith. And it left a long and lasting legacy that we're able to read and study about even today. He was an encourager to all that knew him, except for that one occasion when he was led astray by the Apostle Peter. He was willing to stand up for the character and the reputation of a man that by most accounts would have shunned him and sent him away. He was appointed by the Holy Spirit as a soldier and fellow worker with the Apostle Paul, spreading the gospel in areas that had never heard it. He was a man of integrity, who could handle the preaching and teaching of even the most difficult Bible subjects. He had shortcomings, as we looked at, but his faithfulness prevailed. He was able to overlook the shortcomings of others, see their potential, and encourage men and women of God to do greater things in the kingdom along their pathway. Our exhortation for you this morning is to follow the example of Barnabas. That's our lesson. I appreciate your attention. Perhaps you're in the audience this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've not been baptized into Christ. You're not walking with the Lord. You know what I'm about to say. Please allow me to encourage you to come to the Lord. You won't regret it. It'll be the greatest decision you've ever made. I know the Apostle Paul and Barnabas spent a great portion of their life doing just that, trying to encourage those to come to the Lord. I remember one particular example where Paul was speaking to King Agrippa, and as he laid out the gospel of Jesus in front of King Agrippa, Agrippa res responded, You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. What could I say to persuade you today to become a Christian? How about this? God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life. How could I encourage you any more than to know this? God loves you and wants you to be saved and to spend eternity with him. Can we help you to that end? If you're subject to the invitation, please come forward while together we stand and sing.